He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Because our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. And our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Is our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's a royal. Baptist Church. We are so glad that you have uh, joined us this morning uh, from your living rooms or wherever you happen to be. Uh, we are, are excited to be able to gather together again this morning uh, and to worship God. We at New Baptist Church, we want to know Christ. We want to grow in his word and we want to be a blessing wherever he has placed us. And throughout this time, uh, this year we are memorizing a portion of the Beatitudes. And, and so we want to, to remember these and so I invite you to say them with me this morning. This is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Let's say it together. Seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Join me as we pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to gather to worship. Uh, God, for um, the fact that, that although we may not be gathered in one building, God, we are gathered together in one spirit um, by your power to be able to worship you. Uh, to be able to know you, and to be able to proclaim your goodness. This morning, I pray that you will, um, will be with us, God, that your spirit will, will uh, transform us and change us, that through your word, uh, you may make us your people that you want us to be. May you be pleased with our worship, and God, um, that you will just speak powerfully through the time that we have this morning. We love you, and we thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Um, one of the traditions that we have in New Baptist Church is to pass peace um, during the music, and we want to continue that tradition here. So today, um, during our uh, first song, we will pass peace like we normally do, and during that time, we ask you just to drop a comment, say hi to everybody um, that's watching and tuning in today.
morning, I'm going to be reading Acts 15, 6 through 11. It says, The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. This is God's word today. Welcome this morning. Today I'm going to start a new sermon series from the book of Galatians. And normally the Sunday after Easter, I like to pivot towards an Old Testament study, but I'm not going to do that today. Last year we worked through the book of the prophets nearly for eight months and did not have time to, to do an epistle, a letter in the New Testament. But uh, um, that's not the reason why I'm turning to Galatians today. I really do believe that people's heart um, are, are yearning for the Lord. I believe he's working in people's lives. I believe there's a restlessness of the soul, a tugging. And I believe it's very important for us as a church and for us as believers, as followers of Jesus, to provide people, to give to people a very clear gospel, a answer to that which is tugging upon their hearts. 
This is why I am turning to the book of Galatians today. Um, some background on Galatians before I start. First, um, just some basic information. In roughly 45 A.D., we had Paul's first missionary journey. He travels to, with Barnabas, he travels to an area that is, that is known as a region of Galatia. Um, it's where Galatians are from. And he plants a number of churches there, Iconium, Lystra, Antioch. And, and, and the majority of his work there as he travels on this first missionary journey is not among the Gentiles, but really among the Jews. He goes into a synagogue, he'll present the gospel, he would have these discussions, these teachings, and many people came to believe. And as Jews came to believe, there were the outsiders, the Gentiles, who saw this gospel that, that Paul was preaching, and they too believed. They wanted to become part of this new community that God was forming. And there were debates that came up. Uh, what does it mean to be a Christian? How does one come into this community? And so Paul and Barnabas, they travel to Jerusalem, and there they meet with Peter and the other disciples, and there's a very large debate as to what is required of a person coming to faith. And at the end of that debate, Peter, the authoritative voice, the disciple, that rock, gets up and he says, these are words from Peter, Beth has just read it, I'll read part of it again. Peter is speaking and he says, and he made no distinction between us and them, them being the Gentiles, us being the Jews, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? In verse 11, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. This is the gospel. And so Paul and Barnabas return they share the news to the churches. There's great celebration. There's great joy. The freedom of the gospel and the gospel, the salvation through faith alone. But reading on in Acts, we begin to see there are some problems. People began to approach these churches after Paul had left. Now, just a couple of things. One, that word gospel is simply an abbreviated way of saying good news. The word, the phrase good news and the word gospel are the same thing. And so when these people would travel, um, they began to attack the gospel. They began to turn the gospel not into a good news, it ceased to be good. They turned it into something of man's works, what you must do in order for God to respond to you. Or they made it no longer news, meaning that they compromised it um, by fears or agendas or the desires of the world, that it ceased to be good, and it ceased to be news. And thus the purpose of this book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is simply Paul fighting for the gospel. It's Paul fighting for the gospel. And this is why I feel led to preach through this book today. I believe we need to fight for the gospel. We need to give a very clear understanding clear explanation of what the gospel is so that people may receive it and encounter the grace and the peace of our Lord. So today I will be looking at just the first five verses of Galatians. The first five verses are kind of like your email header. We know we, we are told who it, it is from, who it is to, and the subject line. What is the subject of the book, which is the gospel? And we'll see that in just a moment. So if you have your Bibles, um, please turn to Galatians chapter 1, be reading verses 1 through 5, and keep this open. I'll be staying in this text the remainder of this time. Scripture reads, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this time. I thank you for this opportunity. I ask your hand not only upon this time of, 
uh, an, an honor that I have to share your word and to present your gospel, but I ask your hand upon the hearers, those who are receiving, those who are engaging your word, maybe for the first time, I ask that you will move and work in their lives this morning, Father. I thank you in Christ's name, amen. One of the ways that the people who followed Paul and presented a false gospel, one of the ways that they did this was to attack Paul. And you can almost hear their attack. You can hear them saying things like, Paul, do you know, do you know who he is? He, he never even knew Jesus. He was not a follower of Jesus. I don't think he even met Jesus. And even when the church was beginning to grow, he was a persecutor of the church. How in the world can you trust somebody like that? And maybe they would even add about themselves. You know, I knew Jesus. I met him. I remember I had, he, when he fed the 5,000, I was there. Because again, this is roughly 15 years after the resurrection. It's not that f- far away in time. And so Paul's credibility was being destroyed as a part of destroying the good news, the gospel. And thus, as we open up the book of Galatians, the first thing that Paul says, Paul, an apostle, not through man, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. This is a bombshell. The word apostle has special meaning. Technically, in Greek, it simply means one who is sent, and people use it like that today in some denominations. But in the early church, the word apostle was used to denote the original 12 disciples of Jesus. Those who Jesus purposely called out. Those that he spent time in private and instructed them and trained them and taught them. And after the resurrection, after the ascension, the teaching and witness of the apostles, these 12, minus one, Judas, right? Um, they, their voice was the authoritative voice of the early church. They defined what is doctrine, orthodoxy. They defined what is right practice, orthopraxy. It was their voice. And that's why we read in Acts 15, it is Peter who is speaking, defining what the gospel is. Thus, our New Testament, the book that you're reading today, that is a witness, an apostolic witness of Jesus Christ. It came from the apostles. So you can imagine the bombshell, how remarkable it is when Paul says about himself, I'm an apostle. Not through man, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Paul is claiming in authority to define what doctrine is, in authority to define practice, as high as, just as the authority of, say, Peter, or James, or John. Paul is an apostle, and this authority is based upon a unique, and special encounter he had with the Lord on the road to Damascus. The Lord chose him for a purpose. And Paul's saying, I have been given this authority to, to, to define what the gospel means, what it is, and what it is not. And we need to hang on to that. Paul's going to return to his authority. I do want to make a footnote here that I think is very important. We, as New Baptist Church, we practice a part of this apostolic witness we practice the faith of the apostles as defined by the New Testament. In so much as we are faithful to the New Testament, we are within the tradition of the apostles' witness of Jesus Christ. But, and this is very important, the ministry of the apostles, the apostolic ministry is over. There are no apostles today. That was something of the early church. There is no new doctrine. There is no new practice. There is no new revelation. The ministry of the apostles was to that time. And Paul is one of these. He's saying, I am an apostle. I have a authority to define and to teach the message of Jesus Christ. Moving on, he says in verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And these two words, grace and peace, and peace are the summary of the entire gospel. Simply put, grace is the free gift of God by which our sins are forgiven. 
and we'll talk about that further in just a moment. And peace is the result of this grace. Peace is, the, is what happens when that grace is received. Peace means that we are no longer at war with God. The rebellion is over, and we can define that peace further. Peace, there is peace with God, defined by reconciliation and a restored relationship. There is peace with our own souls. This restlessness finds rest. And there is peace with others. And Paul will talk about this dividing wall, this wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles, but between, between, between us. And, and so the church becomes a new community where all people are welcomed as a, a visible example, a visible working out of this peace that we have. So those two words, grace and peace, are just two summary words of what the gospel is. This is why Paul starts nearly every letter that he writes with these words. May the grace and the peace of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May the gospel be with you. May the good news be with you. And just take a note of that verse 3. The grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I, this is not the sermon to be unpacking the mysteries of the Trinity of God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, but do make note that this grace and peace comes from the Father and the Son, that Jesus is fully God. He's fully divine. He is an agency by which we receive God's grace and peace through the Spirit. Moving on, we have a greater feeling or understanding of what this grace is, what the gift is. Reading on in verse 3, the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. He gave what? Did he give gold? No. Did he give silver? No. Did he give an angel? No. Did he give a stimulus check? No. What did he give? He gave himself. He gave himself. That's the gift. And what did he give himself for? Did he give himself for a crown? No. Did he give himself for a kingdom? No. Did he give himself for riches? No. He gave himself for our sins. He gave himself for our sins. And I'm haunted by this. And when I say haunted, I mean it, it hangs on me. It sticks on me. It, it, it's, it's in my heart. It, it devastates me. He gave himself for my sins, for our sins. Which means that, the, that, that this gift of himself, it speaks to the seriousness of sin. One of the greatest lies in our culture is that we are told or we tell ourselves that our sins are small that they are insignificant, that they are no big deal. But if sin is no big deal, why did he give himself for it? Sin is serious. It is damaging. It is enslaving. It is damning. We are destroyed by our sins. We are held captive by our sins. We hurt ourselves by sin. We hurt others by sin. We dishonor God by our sin. We are blind because of our sin. And ultimately, we die because of our sin. But thanks be to God, he gave himself for our sin. The second thing that I'm haunted by, meaning I'm devastated by, understanding this phrase, this grace that he gave himself for our sins, not only does it tell me how serious my sin is, it also tells me how much I am loved. What a great love this is. Again, Another lie of the world says that you are alone, that no one will love you like you love you, that no one cares for you like you care for you. But here we have the Lord giving himself for our sins. And when we consider the seriousness of sin, we must also recognize the great depth of his love. You're loved more deeply than you can possibly know. You are loved more deeply than you could possibly know. 
I'm moved by this. And I think there is a connection here. The more you recognize this horrific nature of your sin, the more you are overwhelmed by it, by God's grace and the gift of himself for your sin, the more you will know that you are loved. There's a connection there. In the depth of your greatest failure, in the depth of your greatest shameful secrets, the things that you most want to keep hidden about yourself, there you discover the greatness and the quality of God's love for you. And it is for you. Paul doesn't say that he gave himself for the Jewish people's sins, or he gave himself for the disciples' sins, or he gave himself for the righteous people's sins, or, or the good people's sins. He says he gave himself for our sins. We're included in that. You're included in that. Christ gave himself for you. You are loved by him. And he goes on to talk about the peace now of the gospel. He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. Now there's a lot of discussion as to what is meant by this present evil age, and there's a lot of theology and different things people talk about. I tend to take a very existential view of what he's talking about here. I think this is a term that's all-inclusive of things that we experience every day. And I believe that we can define this evil age in a number of different ways. I think it's evil and suffering of our world today that we see, that we experience all around us. Right now, because of this pandemic that we are in, people are terrified. We have a country, nearly the whole world, that is shut down. Millions upon millions have lost their jobs. People are shunning friends and neighbors. There are people who are seeking to make a profit from the suffering of others through the hoarding and black market sales. This deadly disease has become political. It has sown division within our country. There is chaos. Our liberties are limited. And I grieve for, 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 for people in college. I grieve for my, my, my children because their world is changing. What they will have will be different than what I had when I came out of college. It's a different world. And watching the news, I hear stories of people talking about the death of loved ones, of, of waking, waking up each day and wondering, will, will my mother or my father who's in a nursing home, will, they, will I be able to talk to them and find out how they are doing? And, and I've not even begun to, to begin to talk about the injustice and racism and the greed and materialism, the over-sexualization of our culture, and the list goes on and on and on. The sins of the world that destroy and hold us captive, they're, they're all around there's an evil in them. There's a suffering in them. And so I think Paul is purposely talking about this, the evils and suffering of the world. But I also think he's talking about that, that, that evil within our own lives, our own guilt and our own bondage to sin, those things that, that keep, us, keep us weighted down, that we have no power to escape, that we are struggling with, and, and the guilt that that carries. And because of that bondage to sin, our own bondage to death and decay, that ultimately death is the end of us all. This is remarkable. He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age, to deliver us by his grace from the bondage of sin and death and given us victory over the world. And this victory doesn't mean power, that we can do whatever we want. The victory means that we have a life that is greater and survives this world, that we can live in this victory today. We are brought out of this evil age. And this deliverance, moving on in our scripture, and this deliverance from this evil age by his grace and peace is not simply an option among many options it is the way that God has chosen to work. This is what it means when it says, according to the will of our God and Father, the gospel, this grace and this peace, is how God has chosen to work. It's how God has chosen to deliver us from the evils and sufferings of this world and the bondages of our own lives. 
I did not invent it. I did not create it. I did not think it. Uh, and, 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 and this is the way that God has chosen to love. And since it is his idea, and it is his will and his work, all glory belongs to him. And Paul closes with that summary. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that word amen simply means it is true. It is true. Can you say amen to this? Can you say in your own life amen to the gospel? Have you been delivered from this present evil age and know his grace and know his peace can you say amen? If you can, then what God asks of you is not payment. He asks of you gratitude and thanksgiving and praise and glory given to him. But if you cannot say amen, why not? What reason do you give? Why do you reject such a great love and such a great gift? I'm going to close in prayer right now. And as I close in prayer, I just ask that you pray with me. And if you um, do not know the Lord, I ask that you cry out to him. That you cry out to him and ask him to come and work within your life. Let's pray. Gracious Father, what a great gospel you have given to us. What a great grace that we have, this gift of yourself to us for our sin. And so as we read this passage, we are, we are shocked by the depth of our sin because of what you have given. But also we are shocked by the depth of your love because of what you've given. And Father, may we recognize that because of this gift of yourself, the gift of the Son through the cross, through the atonement of our sins, that we are delivered, Father. We're delivered from our sins. We are delivered from the bondage. We are delivered from the things that, that destroy and hurt around us, Father, that we do indeed have a victory in you, a life that is greater than this world, Father. I thank you for this. I thank you for those today who may be hearing who do not know you. I ask that you call their name, that you step into their life, and that they cry out to you, and in that cry, you give them a response. You, you, you draw them towards you and they begin to trust their life in you, Father. I thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen. Romans eight twenty eight says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his promise. This song talks about for good all the way back from Genesis and the story of Joseph. was the younger son how could they have known he would wear a crown this dreamer dreamed while his brother schemed to take him down but Joseph trusted on as one by one the trials came and made him strong and when the moment came that god ordained he raised the man his heart So Joseph could forgive and let his brothers live for what they meant as evil God had meant for good, for good. God 
takes the circumstances and works them out like only he could for good. He puts it all together just the way a loving father would for good. So keep on trusting. I want to thank you again for connecting with us this morning. Uh, we uh, just uh, want to continue to encourage you uh, to connect with us through our, our social media. We've got Instagram and Facebook, uh, YouTube now. Uh, the videos are being uploaded to our website um, through, through YouTube. And so uh, check out newbaptistchurch.com. And uh, you can uh, find out more information there. We're continuing to update uh, things there. Uh, but, but we'll continue to communicate. One of the things, I, I just want to thank you for um, your faithfulness and, 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 and just a continued reminder, as long as we are 
um, under the special orders from the governor that that only those who are working on the live stream uh, are here on, on at the service on, on Sunday mornings. And so um, we will, we're will we looking forward to that time when we can all be gathered back together and we can begin to, to open up the church for, for live worship again soon. Um, and we'll use uh, those, those means of communicating uh, to be able to, to let you know what that looks like as, as that happens more in the future. And so we just look forward to that and be praying for that. Um, also, uh, if you are, uh, if you want to respond, uh, we want to give you an opportunity to do that, uh, just a, a means of connecting. Uh, we are doing Zoom video calls and, and different uh, means of connecting through Sunday schools and small groups, uh, children's and youth ministry. And there is information about that on our website or uh, send us a message on Facebook or whatever platform that you've uh, connected with us on uh, this morning. And, and also, uh, feel free to reach out to the church office and, and just ask, uh, how do I get connected with one of these things? We would love to continue to connect as part of the community of this church that lives out the gospel, as Trent talked about earlier today. Um, Finally, I, I just want to thank you. Um, we, we are so grateful um, for your faithfulness to continue to give through the season. Um, we know it's not easy. There's all these different you know, mechanisms and ways that we've offered. And, and so we just we thank you for your faithfulness. And, and it, is, it is noticed. It is, it is something we are absolutely grateful for. Um, if you are still looking for a way to do that, you can mail a check to the church or um, uh, connect with a link uh, to Venmo or, or PayPal. And uh, those are just opportunities to be able to, to do that. And so I just want to pray for us now, and, uh, and then we'll conclude our service here in just a moment. So let's pray. God, thank you for your, uh, for, for your love, for your, your gospel. Um, God, for the way that um, you sent Jesus for our sins, um, that we can respond to you uh, with gratitude and praise and joy. And, and God, just in this moment, um, recognizing that the— the elements of this world um, seem to distract us. They seem to be dark and overshadowing and worrisome. God, you have overcome all of that, and you offer us life with you. And, and God, we just praise you for that. God, as we respond in, in, uh, in many ways, whether it's just drawing closer to you, whether um, it is a, a first-time decision to, to trust you as our Lord, uh, realizing that we can't save ourselves, that we can't earn it ourselves, God, that, that you will just draw people to themselves. And God, as we just continue to praise you um, through this time of the service, um, but also throughout our week this week, God, may you be pleased. Um, we, we ask that you continue to, to bless us as a church and each uh, person that is, is watching and connecting through the service now, wherever they happen to be and whenever this happens to be. And God, we know that you are at work and um, we thank you for that and we praise you. And we, we ask all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory sheds on our way while we do His good will. He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise not a cloud in the sky but his smile quickly drives it away not a doubt nor a fear not a sign nor a tear can abide while we trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let's pray. Gracious Father, once again I'm so grateful for you. We have nowhere else to go. We have nowhere else to look to but you. For to you alone belongs all glory and honor and power and it's to you that we come. 
And Father, this morning, I do pray for those who are in need. I pray for those who are working in our hospitals, our doctors and nurses. I ask your protection and strength given to them. I pray for those who are working on the streets, the EMS and the police and the fire and those who are serving people in critical ways. I ask your protection on them. Father, I pray for moms and dads who are at home with children who um, are just struggling to keep the household together and to pay bills and, and to care and to be patient. Lord, I ask that you protect these homes and these families and give them the ability to grow deeper during this time. I pray for those, Father, who are, who are in the hospitals, those who are receiving care. I pray for healing upon their bodies and that they will recover fully. I pray for those who are in our nursing homes, those who are in care facilities. I ask that you protect them and that you keep them safe, Father, and that you will soon allow a day when loved ones can surround them and they can be together. I pray for those who are just depressed, who are weighted down, who are struggling by this time of, of this virus, Father. I pray that you encourage them, that they lean on you, they lean into you and find a strength that is greater than anything in this world, Father. I ask your hand be upon these people. I ask that you watch over them during this time, and we close out this day giving you all thanks and glory. In Christ's name, amen.